TorahCafe.com. It has been a delight getting to have the time to fellowship with you and to share a mutual passion for the protection and the security of Israel. And I was asked earlier why would a Goyim, a Christian like me, be in, interested in Israel? Sometimes I, I feel like that my passion for the uh, goodness of Israel um, maybe exceeds even some of my Jewish friends. And I tell people, I said, you, you have to understand that it is entirely possible to be Jewish and not have a relationship to Christians, but it is impossible to be Christian and not have a complete relationship in Judaism because it is, in fact, the foundation upon which every Christian believes and every Christian understands that Israel is God's chosen land. And we recognize that and we respect it. And understand that the nations who bless Israel will be blessed. And those who curse Israel will be cursed. My first trip to Israel was exactly 40 years ago this year. When in July of 1973, just a couple of months before the Yom Kippur War, I made my first trip to Israel and I was just a teenager. I've been going back to Israel ever since 1973 for 40 years. I've been thinking... You know, Moses only had the children of Israel in the wilderness for 40 years. I've been going back for 40 years. There's got to be some connection there. Now, I will be brief tonight for the simple reason that I still have to fly to Florida as soon as I leave here. And uh, you also have many other wonderful people on the program that I can assure you are going to be more interesting to listen to than me. But when I visited the Gush Katif Museum just a couple of years ago, it was a brutal reminder of what happens when politicians make decisions that don't involve their brain. Because, in, in a way, when you ask people, no, when you demand that people abandon their homes, and when you do it because you somehow believe that you can trust radical Islamic fascists to keep their word and to make nice, if you make nice, then it shows a level of naivete that makes Chamberlain look like Churchill. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time we recognize you don't negotiate with people who do not believe that you have a right to even exist, much less live next to you. I cannot understand why the Secretary of State visited Egypt and handed over a check for $250 million when we're closing the White House to tours. That makes no sense at all. Why do you give F-16s and Abram tanks to a country whose elected president associated with a terrorist organization who has openly and publicly called Jews bloodsuckers and the descendants of apes and pigs, why would you reward someone for that kind of behavior? And even in his Senate confirmation hearings when John Kerry said they will be held accountable, I got to wondering, is accountability being given F-16s, tanks, and $250 million? Then, Mr. Secretary, please hold me accountable, because I'd like $250 million. And if that's what it takes to make radical, ridiculous, offensive, inexcusable statements like that, then we should all share in the spoils. This is absurd. And now word is that when the president visits Israel later this month, that he will ask, not the Israeli leaders, because it would be seen in bad form to lecture them, although he's been willing to do it before. But it is reported that he will ask the Israeli people to make sacrifices for peace. 
If that is the case, I would love to escort him personally to the Gush Katif Museum and say, Mr. President, the Israelis have made many sacrifices for peace. Can you show me one sacrifice that the Palestinians have made for peace? I've yet to see it. I would say, Mr. President, I believe the Israelis have given and given and given, and for it they have received nothing in return. And every trip I make to Israel, I always venture into the old city. I go into some of the shops where one can purchase a Palestinian map. This past year, I took, uh, this past month rather, in February, I had 200 people that I took with me to Israel, most of whom are Christians, most of whom had never been before. I wanted them to understand what is unique about this situation? And I got one of those maps and I said, by the way, open the map up and show me where Israel is. And they opened it up and they didn't see it. And I said, interesting, isn't it? And somehow the people of Israel are being asked to make peace with a people who even in their published maps refuse to acknowledge even so much as the existence of the nation of Israel. And that's why if our president makes the absurd suggestion that Israel should go back to the pre-67 borders, I'm thinking, well, if we're going to roll back, let's just roll all the way back to Abraham and let's let the borders be the borders that originally were established. Let's go as far back as we can go. The Gush Katif Museum is a stark reminder that sometimes things happen in our past that we need to commemorate, not because they're pleasant, but because they are sobering reminders of the mistakes that have been made in the past. We should not forget that Bull Connor turned the fire hoses on African Americans in the 60s in Alabama. We should not forget that James Meredith was not allowed to attend the University of Mississippi. We should not forget that the Little Rock Nine were blocked from the door of Little Rock Central High School by the governor of the state in 1957. Those are not pleasant things, but they are important things because they remind us of what happens when politicians make the wrong decisions and how it affects people and how long it takes to come from beyond it. And so I say tonight that the reason that I wish that the president, and I wish he would be accompanied by as many of the Israeli officials as is possible, would attend the Gush Katif Museum while he's there and watch those films and talk to the people like Rivka, who is here tonight, who personally experienced it. I wish that that could happen so that the next time he suggests that the Israelis stop building bedrooms for their children in the land that is theirs. That instead he would spend his time not asking the Israelis to stop building bedrooms, but that he would demand that the Iranians stop building bombs pointed at Israel and the rest of the free world. Israel often gets criticized for the acts that it takes to protect its children. The construction of the security wall, which I have flown over almost in its entirety in a helicopter and personally seen that security wall. And I tell you today, as you already know, that until that security wall was erected, it was a common occurrence for people to strap bombs to their bellies and board a bus and kill innocent children and citizens. And with the construction of that fence, those acts stopped immediately and permanently. Shall we be critical of those who wish to protect their babies? Shall we truly be critical of those who wish to have peace in the neighborhoods and allow their children to play in a park or for their wives to be able to go to a cafe or a supermarket without the fear of being blown up by a terrorist. We would never tolerate 
in our own cities, what the people of Storo have been asked to tolerate. And I have been to Storo, and I've seen the thousands of Katusha rockets stacked up behind the police station. I stood there with Dove Hyken and Joe Frager and Paul Brody and others who are in this room tonight. And I can tell you that it is an absolute sobering experience to understand that people have feared every day that a Katusha rocket would land on their children's bedroom land in the park where they played, in the schools that they attended, in the synagogues where they worshipped, and we would not tolerate that. And I've asked Americans, how many Katusha rockets fired from Toronto into Buffalo, New York, do you think it would take before Americans demanded that we do something and absolutely stop it? 5,000? 4,000? 3,000? 100? No! One! One Katusha rocket! and we would demand that it stop. And the Israelis have been asked to let it go after thousands of them. I say no. One is enough, thousands are too many, and it is time for the Israelis to quit apologizing to the world and to say, we have a right for a secure and safe homeland, not just for us, but for those grandchildren and great-grandchildren and our descendants who will come after us. A place that is a safe place, a haven, and if anybody should wonder why that is so necessary, well, it was brought back to me not only by my repeated visits to Yad Vashem, but this past holiday in January, my wife and I traveled to Poland. We went to Schindler's factory, and then we went to Auschwitz and Birkenau. And I stood in the very room where 1.1 million of your relatives and your friends and your ancestors were marched into that very room and were murdered in cold blood. And I stood there as the chills came over me as I realized what had happened in that room and I prayed, may the world never forget what happened. Because if we forget what did happen, it can happen yet again. And when people ask why is it important for Israel to have secure borders and safety, I would love to take them to Auschwitz, stand them in that room, and ask them, do you think for one moment that if these had been your parents and your grandparents, that you would be a bit uneasy about being told that it would be all right for people who have vowed to exterminate and kill every one of you to live as close as nine miles in a border? I think not. And that's why I believe with all my heart that when the president goes to Israel, it is important that the American people give him a message rather than him to give the Israelis a message. And the message is, Mr. President, Americans stand with Israel because they are a mirror image of our freedom and our democracy in this country. And we suggest that before you make any demands of the Israelis to give up anything, that you sit down and look the Palestinians in the face and ask them, what have they given up? And tell them, as I would love to do if I were making that trip as the chief executive, rather than to say to the Israelis, stop building in Judea and Samaria, I would suggest that you build as rapidly as you can, as much as you can, as many houses as you can, and tell the Palestinians that if they don't like that, the way they can fix it is to sit at the peace table and sign an agreement that they recognize Israel's right to exist, to exist within the borders that God gave them, and to exist with safety and security. That, my friend, will probably never happen. So I say pour the concrete, build the houses, and let Israel be strong. That, my friend, is the message we need to get to the world. Thank you, and God bless you.